This is our 11th season of Hewerman Lectures, and this is the kickoff le uh, lecture for this season. Um, as of this morning, I was going to be watching from the, uh, the crowd just like you guys, but uh, Mike uh, is under the weather today, so he's unable to be with us. So I uh, get the privilege of welcoming you uh, to this, uh, this Hewerman Lecture that is uh, a space for ag. NASA satellites and science to support water and food security. And so uh, I bet a lot of us, when we think of NASA, do not think of agriculture as connected to NASA. I think after today's conversation, you will all think about NASA and ag together when you hear NASA uh, in the future. Uh, these Hewerman lectures uh, are sponsored by Keith and Norma Hewerman of Phillips. Uh, they're not able to be with us here today, but uh, they're watching online. And so their son Scott is here. Thank you for being here. And let's uh, give them a round of applause. For <laughs> the 11 years of support that they've shown to this lecture series has enabled the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources to uh, focus on a wide variety of subjects. I see a lot of you here that have come uh, probably pretty religiously. There's maybe some of you that haven't missed a lecture over these 11 years, but uh, this uh, allows us to discuss timely topics in depth and get insight that uh, we normally wouldn't have from experts that come from not uh, the UNL campus, but from all over the world. And so that's been a very exciting time. Uh, the format of the lecture today, our keynote speaker, Karen St. Germain, will give about a 20-minute uh, uh, talk, and then we'll be joined by some panelists and have a Q&A session afterwards. Karen has been with us this morning here at uh, the Institute. We spent some time with a farmer uh, north of, out by Wahoo, then we were at the NREC for a couple hours, had a great discussion about uh, the research that UNL is doing, uh, how that connects to NASA, NASA assets that we actually use in some of that research and some of the modeling we do that you'll probably hear more about as we go on, uh, as we talk this afternoon. So if, for those of you that are watching online, if you want to submit questions, there's an online form that you can probably see there, but there's also, we can do that using the Twitter hashtag uh, pound sign HL series. So even for people here in the audience, if you're bashful and don't want to wave your hand at the end when we get to the question and answer uh, period, uh, remember you can use that hashtag HL series that she has uh, up there on the screen if you want to jot that down. Uh, Dr. Mark Swoboda will be our moderator uh, this afternoon and he'll be introducing Dr. St. Germain as well as uh, uh, the other panelists. Uh, Mark and I go back, I think we were, I just was asking him if it was true, I think around 2002 for that drought when uh, he was uh, uh, one of the co-founders at that time of the National Drought Mitigation Center. We worked together and then uh, through the climate assessment and risk, uh, uh, climate, CART, climate assessment and risk, risk. committee. Mm -hmm that uh, was formed by the legislature <coughs> that Roger probably remembers that met regularly. It was, it was Roger's bill. I, I, that doesn't surprise me. I should remember that. <laughs> but uh, uh, so we worked together through there, and so it's nice to reconnect coming back here to the University of Nebraska. As many of you farmers in the audience know that uh, USDA has uh, been a major supporter of the Drought Mitigation Center and the National Drought Monitor. USDA has incorporated Mark's work into uh, federal farm programs. Uh, we no longer have to, uh, as farmers, when we hit certain 
stages on the drought uh, monitor. We don't have to call USDA and ask them to consider approving us. There's triggers that are, are hit at that point in time based on the monitor that automatically goes into federal assistance. So we very much appreciate that. And uh, Mark has a long list of credentials. He serves on committees not only here in the United States, but he's on FAO committees that uh, work with the United Nations. He's uh, taken the drought monitor and the expertise we've developed here to create the US drought monitor and helped other countries create a monitor similar to that. And so we're very happy to have him uh, here to moderate and connect uh, his relationship with NASA to uh, the relationships uh, that we have uh, here um, in, in the university as well as other places. So with that, Mark, if you'd like to come forward and take over, you have a lavalier mic, so you don't I need do. this mic. So Thanks, Craig. Thank you a lot, and yeah, yeah. good luck. Yeah, thank you. This should be an easy one to drive. It's exciting times. Uh, school starting, uh, but to have the NASA team, and it's not just Dr. St. Germain, but also uh, several of her teams and program managers, people we've had a relationship with over uh, 20 years now. Uh, this all was born out of uh, sitting down and being a part uh, at the invitation of NASA at the Commodity Classic in New Orleans. Big producer-driven event. I don't know if many of you have heard of it or been to it. Uh, but a great opportunity with NASA's Hyperwall. If you just want to Google that, it's pretty cool stuff. So, uh, you know, sitting down and talking with Karen, I found out she actually started a career fresh out of grad school here at the university in electrical engineering. And uh, so let me just jump into her bio. Um, so prior to being with NASA, where she is the division director of Earth Science, right? Um, she was the deputy assistant administrator under NOAA Satellite and Information Service. Uh, prior to that, she served on the Space Strategic and Intelligence Systems Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition. Um, and she has performed research aboard icebreakers in the Arctic and Antarctic. She's flown through hurricanes, tropical storms, and she's measured glacial ice on snowmobile traverses of the Greenland ice sheet. So I guess you could say Karen's almost a sensor in her own right. Um, <laughs> So very impressive and very privileged to have her and her team here. Uh, great stuff. I, I, I look forward to the conversation because she really wants to engage uh, you folks and, and hear from you uh, what our needs are. So it's a good opportunity to speak up on that. Uh, let me also take the opportunity to introduce the panelists so we get all the introductions out of the way and then Karen's going to come up and, and give her spiel. And then the panelists will have a, a short five minute after that before the Q&A. So Brandon Honeycutt, who's down here in the front row, uh, owner and partner of Honeycutt Farms, also a member of the Nebraska, he's a vice chair of the Nebraska Corn Board and also the National Corn Growers Association Board of Directors. So representing uh, Nebraska well out of South Central Nebraska, mixed operation, corn, soybeans, uh, popcorn, et cetera. Uh, constantly trying to use the latest in technology to improve efficiencies and sustainability. Um, which resonates well with the mission of the Hearman Lecture Series. It's all about sustainability and security. So I think you'll see that common theme woven in with all the speakers today, which will fit nice. If you're thinking, how does that fit into the Hearman Series? Um, I think it's a really logical fit. Uh, Brandon's role is to assess and implement ideas and practices in the areas of agronomy, sustainability, technology, and marketing. As the Vice Chair of Nebraska's Corn Board, he helps develop carry out and participate in programs of research, education, market development, promotion to enhance profitability and expand and demand the value of Nebraska corn and value added corn products. And then our uh, last panelist is going to be Jackson Stansel, uh, a native of Alabama, so uh, transplant here to Nebraska. He has, through his master's work, developed a prototype uh, end-time fertigation management system software. So uh, he's the founder and CEO um, of, of this effort. He is now also a part-time PhD here at the university in bioengineering. And prior to that, he was at uh, Harvard University uh, in 2019 
in engineering sciences. So I think you could say he's going to bring smart farming to us with his stuff here this afternoon. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over and have uh, Karen come up. If you help me welcome her to the stage. Um, it's so great to be back here in Lincoln. Um, as, as Mark mentioned, I started my career here when I was a pup, straight out of graduate school. I was uh, an assistant professor in electrical engineering. I started a little nascent remote sensing research program. And the only reason I left is that I got an opportunity to build a satellite system. And so I, uh, I went back east. And, uh, and built my first satellite uh, that launched in 2002, and it is still flying. So, uh, but it is, it is great to be here. Um, I, how many of you are wondering why someone from NASA would be here? Anybody? Yeah, a few, anyway. Um, yeah, most people, when they think of NASA, they think of rovers landing on Mars, or they think of the Webb Space Telescope, or, um, or the return to the moon. What, uh, what most people don't know is that the planet NASA studies the most is our home planet. And the answer is, is obvious if you think about it, because NASA's mission is about the betterment of mankind. And everyone we know and everyone we love is right here on this planet, right? So understanding how this planet works and helping people make better decisions, informed decisions, science-informed decisions, is really what we're about in Earth science. So Earth, the Earth Science Program at NASA has about, today, 25 different satellite or space-based missions looking back down at the Earth, measuring everything from uh, precipitation in the atmosphere. That's what uh, the middle this little satellite system is, is measuring. It's the Global Precipitation Mission. The, uh, the lower one is the Soil Moisture Mission called SMAP. And of course, Landsat up there, which you're all probably very familiar with. These are just a few of the many, many missions that we have looking back at the Earth. We have, as I said, almost uh, about 25 missions flying. We're in the middle of building another 10 or so, and we're planning the ones that come after that. And that's part of the reason that I'm here to talk with you today. It takes a while to build and launch a new capability. So one of the things we want to do is make sure that we're building the most impactful systems for the future so we're all smarter 10 years from now than we are today. And we also know that we're seeing changes. We're seeing changes in the water cycle, and that's leading to changes in the carbon cycle or leading to challenges in agriculture. Um, and and you know, the manifestation of that is, in some areas, drought, and in other areas, flooding, or severe weather. The, uh, the image over there on the left was actually the derecho that came through um, in 2020. So one of the ways that we, uh, that we try to bring utility from the observations we make from space is to integrate them with crop models. So uh, you know, as you all know, of course, a crop model uh, factors in the, the genotype or what, what's getting planted where and when, the management practices, but also the environmental conditions. And that's really where, where we come in. And I'll talk more about, uh, about that in just a little bit. So let's see. Can I make it go? Yes. All right. So this is our NASA Earth Science fleet. These are all of the missions that we have uh, orbiting the Earth looking down. Some of them are as big as a coach bus. Some of them are the size of a carry-on suitcase. And we have some that are the size of a shoebox. We also have instruments on the International Space Station. And these are measuring things like temperature, uh, water content. Uh, uh, they're measuring different attributes of vegetation, uh, uh, pollutants in the atmosphere, all, all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, what, so what's going on here? Well, we know, because we measure it, that the difference between the energy coming into the Earth system 
and the energy leaving the Earth system, that's called the imbalance, we know that's growing. That number is about doubled in the last 15 years. So where does all that energy go? It is mostly being absorbed by our oceans. Over 90% of it is being absorbed in the oceans. And that, I'm going to try something else here. Um, that energy that's being absorbed in the oceans is getting transported all over the world by the ocean's currents. And that is changing our weather patterns. And all that extra energy in the system is what is intensifying the water cycle. As you all know better than most, the water cycle is mostly uh, the water that we need to, uh, to live on land is, originates in the oceans and it gets delivered to us by the atmosphere. Right? So that cycle's intensifying. That's what's leading to more drought in some regions. Drier areas getting drier, maybe. And that's creating a lot of challenges, particularly in agriculture. So looking to the future, how do we prepare for that? How do we, how do we ready ourselves as, as well as we can? And that's what we're here to, uh, to talk about. By the way, that's also why we're seeing increased intensification and sometimes rapid intensification of tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, we're seeing that as the oceans warm, that layer of warm water gets deeper. That's feeding uh, more rapid storm intensification. So what do we do? Well, I'm going to talk about a couple of different uh, phases. I'm, I'm going to, in the next few slides, I'm just going to talk to you about some of the capabilities we have today that can help inform real-time decisions uh, as, as people need to make them today. And then uh, in a little bit, in a few minutes, I'll, I'll take a look toward the future. So this plot is looking at monthly hail damage swaths across the Great Plains in the Midwest. The color coding is by month. And this kind of product, again, which is, is automatically uh, is derived from our satellite imagery, can help us really understand the, the patterns, the magnitude, the frequency, and the intensity of these events. We can also monitor drought from space. This is, I'm not gonna lie, this is one of, this product comes from, mostly, from one of my favorite, favorite satellite systems. It's really cool. What it does, it's a, it's a pair of satellites that fly in formation, and together, they can detect very minute changes in the Earth's gravitational pull right below them. And that happens when mass moves. The less mass that's below the satellite, the less gravitational pull. Well, the mass below the satellite decreases when the water decreases. And so in this way, we can measure these minute changes in the Earth's gravitational field, and that can tell us when water comes and goes. And, and we can determine the difference between root zone soil moisture and shallow groundwater. This is a new product, it's a, it's a prototype, and this is a 14-day look ahead for soil moisture. Now this is, uh, this is surface soil moisture, and this, uh, what you're looking at, is uh, data from August 18th, so just a few days ago, and this was the projection we made prior to that, two weeks prior, on, on August 4th. And so you can see that, you know, so th this is what we predicted would happen, and this is what actually happened. So, you know, we're, as, a, as a demonstration product, we're looking to, uh, to have folks give this a try and let us know if it's useful to them in terms of their, their planning. The Ogallala Aquifer, so the same instrument, the same system that I me mentioned, these, this gravitational system, it can also uh, see changes in aquifer uh, status, basically. So on the left, you see this is the uh, USGS product uh, looking at depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer based on wells. And on the right, you see the product that's based on our, uh, our satellite system. And we know that when we assimilate the satellite data 
into the models, we do a much better job of predicting uh, and understanding what's happening with those water levels. This is another fairly recent product. It's called OpenET. It's, uh, it's based largely on Landsat data, and it gives you field-level evapotranspiration estimates. It's freely available, and uh, again, we're just, it rolled out, well, within the last year, so we're still uh, getting feedback on this. But this is the kind of information that we try to make freely available based on the satellite systems that we build. Now, how about looking further into the future? All right, so this is uh, corn. Um, sorry, corn is in yellow, soy is in green. Uh, this happens to be in Iowa. The intensity, the brightness of each pixel is proportional to our predicted yield. And what we did was we, we developed a crop model, again, that, um, that integrates information about what got planted, how it was managed, and then used our environmental information to predict the yield. And then we, we, um, we compared to what actually happened. And uh, most of our data was, was actually at the county level but it compared pretty well. So why might that be useful? Well, it might be useful if you want to look ahead, right? So that's what we're doing here. For corn and wheat, we take our climate models, which, which uh, give us a statistical forecast of temperature and rainfall and so forth into the future, and we use that as the input to the crop model. Now, for this run, we assumed that genotype and management practices were held the same. And we, so the only variable is how the, uh, the heat and water, primarily, are going to change. But what, you, what this shows you is the stress that we're going to start to see in corn yields, or we would start to see in corn yields if we didn't make any adaptive uh, measures, around the world and largely close to the equator. Conversely, wheat yields in this model do pretty well. Now, I want to be really clear. This is not a prediction at all, right? We are, uh, producers are already adapting what they plant, where they plant it, how they manage it. So it's not a, a predictive tool. It, but it is a projection tool that allows you to now start running if-then scenarios against what we think are going to be the growing conditions in the future. So again, this is a, this is a new tool that we've been developing with folks in the agriculture community to start testing these kinds of ideas. So uh, this, is, this is my last slide, and this is just to show you um, each one of those dots represents a different observation that's being made by a different NASA satellite. Some of them are of the uh, ice in the Arctic, the atmosphere, the oceans, vegetation, soil moisture. But we're doing our best to character characterize the entire Earth as a system and then bring that understanding to help tackle local challenges. And so we're here today, and, and, and quickly now we're going to get to the panel discussion, to really talk about how we can take what we do at the global level and at the regional level and make it impactful for people making decisions at the local level. And, and that always, always, always happens through partnerships, through the people who live and work here who know the most about the, the, the practices and the conditions uh, and so forth. So, um, so with that, I really look forward to the conversation and, uh, and with my fellow panelists. And, um, and after the initial panel discussion, we'll bring a couple more of our NASA experts up and we'll, uh, we'll have a good Q&A period. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you, Karen. Center. 
Okay, so it's always hard to fo follow the NASA person and their graphics, so I'm going to try my best. Um, <laughs> remote from you, Karen. But I think, I think it's a good segue what I'm going to uh, talk to you about. Um, so Karen already touched on the scale, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to show some applications of NASA data, parts, I guess, the fruit of those collaborations she just spoke of and some of the efforts that have uh, resulted out of that uh, collaboration here at the University of Nebraska. Um, and that's beyond just the, the drought center. So to set some overall context, you know, our work is global. I know that N stands for uh, the National Drought Mitigation Center, but really we work here in Nebraska, so the N could stand for Nebraska, and we, we work internationally. Um, Brad Dorn would say the N stands for knowledge, but we won't, we won't go there. <laughs> um, so these are some of the issues we deal with. Now, here in the United States, we've seen some of the issues that can arise also from the supply chain. COVID's given us a good glimpse of what developing countries have gone through when it comes to getting food, healthcare, everything else delivered out on the ground in uh, developing countries. So there's a lot to motivate us and how do we better monitor those countries that don't have the luxury of the in-situ networks that we have here? Don't have the luxury of free data. And how do we do that? We integrate in a lot of NASA data and uh, from some of the, uh, the European Space Agency as well to augment that, those in-situ networks. And so I'm gonna show you a few things here as we go forward. But drought is different than all the other hazards. It's got a, la a potentially large spatial footprint and a really potentially long temporal footprint. It can, you know, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, think about it. Pretty small footprint, pretty short-lived, then they're gone. Droughts can cover millions of square miles or hectares and can last months, years, or decades. We're seeing this in the Western US right now. We're not immune to it here in the United States. The drawdown of Lake Mead and Powell is alarming. The river was already over allocated. Um, there's no more room for any more straws in the drink. So we've come a long way in monitoring drought. This was one of the first drought maps out there. This was hand drawn probably based on agricultural reports in from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And ironically, a lot of the drought mitigation center work and funding these days comes from the Office of Chief Economist. This was from the Bureau of Ag Economics. Um, so they've had a lot of skin in the game on drought before it kind of migrated out of the Weather Bureau within USDA into NOAA. So there's a good example of uh, the drought of, of 1934. Greg, do you remember that drought well? out there around Sumner. Um, this became the state of the art in the 50s with the advent of the Palmer Drought Severity Index, but it was really the only show in town. One index, very coarse resolution. Those are called climate divisions, which are really crop reporting areas for a lot of, of the states, not all of them, but they mimicked a lot of what was coming out of the lineage of the USDA, because Wayne Palmer worked, worked in the Weather Bureau there at the USDA. So very coarse resolution, right? Well, this is when we came along and worked on this new product called the Drought Monitor, which has evolved a lot from that first day. Um, that was not done in GIS, Geographic Information System. That was uh, truly, truly hand-drawn. I won't even tell you the package because it's kind of embarrassing. Um, but we've come a long ways. This is the map where we are today and how it's made is immensely different. We had five or six inputs when we started in the late 90s, and now we have over 50. Um, and you can see the degree of resolution is thanks to improving our accuracy, is augmenting our in situ network, which we'll never have enough of, never have a dense enough network, never have it spatially uh, perfect the way you would want it optimally. So we use satellite data and models to augment that in situ network, but we need both. The in situ data validates the NASA products that Karen just showed. Can we trust them? Can I trust them where I don't have any data because I know they perform well where I do have data? Same with the models, the land data simulation system models. I'm gonna show you examples of these in a minute. So this is our state of the science. This is hosted here at the University of Nebraska at the Drought Mitigation Center. We're in the School of Natural Resources. Uh, but it is a partnership with USDA and NOAA up front. So the authorship rotates 
between those groups. And what we're trying to do is capture the elements of the hydrologic cycle. So a lot of those products you just saw fit a piece of this hydrologic system, particularly on the groundwater. You know, the Grace Advent, in fact, a little factoid, we worked with Matt Rodell, Dr. Wardlow, Dr. Sagai, Tedessa, myself, uh, the Drought Center team and others uh, on the GRACE, validating the GRACE. You can edit from a drought perspective, did a lot of iterations uh, in the early stages of GRACE to get it where it is now. And we actually host the website uh, for NASA on that particular product. And so that's a real privilege to do that in partnership with, with NASA. So the, the drought monitor is much, much more than just what's falling out of the sky in precipitation. We have to monitor the effectiveness of the rainfall into the soil, to groundwater, stream flows, et cetera. Snowpack's huge in the West, right? Snow water equivalent. Satellites help us monitor and, and cover a large area to do just that. We have to cover 50 states in two and a half days. Uh, years like this year, that's a real challenge with about 50% of the lower 48 in drought. Um, so it's a pretty hectic year. Probably the last year like this, you'd have to go back to about 2012 which some of you remember, may remember that drought here in Nebraska and the central U.S. Uh, to me, what's exciting about uh, the NASA suite is because of the flash drought in 2012, and the Drought Center's been working on flash drought since 2002, we were, we were flash drought when flash drought wasn't cool, as they say. Um, we worked with many partners to develop tools to respond to the rapid, I mean, Karen mentioned these rapid extreme events. And, and uh, you know, this is a direct impact that we're seeing from uh, a warming world. So days in between rain events, intensity of rain when they came. My daughter lives in Dallas now, 10 inches of rain last night. I mean, car's totally covered. Um, she's a nurse. She just stayed at the hospital. She couldn't get home. Um, we're living it right now. We're living it. And these tools are letting us view it right now. And we couldn't do that on some of these things 10, 12, 15 years ago. So these tools at the bottom, I won't go into each of them, but you know, I mentioned Grace. She, she said gravity-based. I think you were talking about Grace, I hope. <laughs> um, all of these have helped us better monitor these rapid onset or intensifying events. Again, to get at that hydrologic cycle. Okay, I just have, I think, two slides up. Um, some newer products my team has helped develop here at the Drought Center. Uh, newer, I showed you that Palmer Drought Index, remember, very coarse, climate division based, multiple county. Now you've got many inputs now we can get down at that 4, 8, and 12 kilometer. So we can get a much finer resolution product, we can get a more accurate product. And we want to make the drought monitor better because, as, as I like to say, someone's always on the wrong side of the line. So we got to make sure the line's as good as we can get it. Um, I don't think you can just purely throw it all on the computer and spit out the magic holy grail number and you're in D2 and you're in D3, right? There's subject matter expert, there's, there's 450 people on the ground in each of the United States that contribute to that map. So there's a lot that goes on behind the green curtain in making the weekly drought monitor. But I feel a lot better about the accuracy myself when I know this stuff's going into it. We just started a quasi-operational flash drought blend, uh, working with partners here at the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Uh, using that ACES database funded by USDA Office of Chief Economist. That's a new one, hot off the press. I mean, we're just looking, it's not even out to the public yet. Um, and, and so uh, it was fun to watch how that worked this summer, and we think it captured the patterns pretty well. The more we can do to speed up our response to rapid events, the better we can be accurate on that map, which producers rely on. And now we've taken that out, I think Greg mentioned it, we've taken that out globally, working with World Bank, working with USAID, working with the United Nations to develop these combined drought indicator products that these countries are now standing up as operational early warning systems. So that all started off the basic science of the drought monitor, evolved into more of a computer automated fashion because they don't have in-situ data or very little of it. And so uh, it's, very, it's very exciting and pleasing to see the applications that the drought center is doing using data from groups like NASA and collaborations around the world. So some final thoughts. We've got to do a better job now of bringing uh, our, our existing land data models and assimilation systems into the, into the you know, this, this realm, if you will. Uh, how fast can we get the data without a lag? So that's what we call latency. 
Um, if my data is four or five days old when I already get it and I'm making a weekly product, I'm gonna already have an accuracy issue, all right? So we're working with NASA, uh, specifically Goddard Space Flight Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, to integrate in new models on the land data assimilation system and integrate those in uh, using other data. And it's not just all NASA. I mean, we're here about NASA today, but you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of skin in the game by a lot of players and a lot of agencies. But I feel these can help us better address flash drought. And as I already mentioned, then I think we can take these beyond the US and we already are. Um, so I'm excited to see where that goes in the next 10 years as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brandon for his comments. All right. Thank you very much. You know, from a farmer's perspective, it's really, really great to be here, especially one from, from Hamilton County who, you know, it's great to have Keith Hearman uh, sponsor this just for the great work he did, not just for Nebraska, but in our county as well. But there is a lot of challenges we face on the farm, and there's a lot of the things that we obviously can control, what seed we're planting, amount of fertilizer, um, what herbicides we're going to use, etc. But when it comes down to water, that's the the key element that becomes the, the massive challenge of a great year versus a, a poor year. And, and we're blessed because we're fully irrigated. Um, you know, so when, when droughts come in, um, strangely it becomes one of probably the best times that for, for us yield wise, because it means we probably have a lot of sunshine, a lot of heat, and we can pump water. But what we learned um, from my, my perspective on the farm is when I came back to the farm in, in uh, 1999, I believe, it was, we were monitoring our, our soil moisture, we were doing some things the, the old fashioned way, the hand field, hand field test, you know, trying to figure out how much we need to water, listen to the radio station, see what the ET was, and learned very quickly that a lot of that wasn't accurate. Um, and we got more involved with that working with UNL on some very, the beginning stage of using soil moisture monitoring, monitoring systems, just little, little soil probes that we're putting out there, and they, they were they worked well because they gave us the initial look at what's going on in the soil and what's going on in the water. And we've slowly moved through that to try to figure out how do we get to the point that we can better time and better place water. But our challenge becomes is that if we're using a probe, we're in one static point in the field. Well. Is that, your, is that your best area, your worst area, the average area, the multiple soil types, which we really don't have in our area, so there's some of that we're blessed with. Um, so we, we integrate to the net, we, we upgrade to the next, next platform, which is more data points as the pivot goes around. But that still becomes a challenge because you're still in a really small area trying to figure out what's going on. And so when you, we start looking at this, of, okay, what's the next step we need to do, and being able to more accurately monitor, maybe it, maybe it is through satellite imagery um, or satellite data that we, that we can say, okay, this farm as a whole is okay. We, we, we don't need to turn on the pivot yet because we realized over the years we were way over watering and when we talked about the Ogallala Aquifer, you know, without that in Nebraska, you know, we, we, we don't have the production we, we currently have. So what is it we can do to protect that um, from, from the perspective of looking ahead and that, that's one that caught my eye because if, if we have a 14 day look ahead okay now we can start making some some decisions and th those become real decisions on whether it's it's water whether it's fertilizer whether it's it's a fungicide whatever the case might be but looking at it going okay what is it that we can do to impact the farm in a positive way because we're always trying to figure out what is the next next big thing for yield what is the next big thing to bring more value back to the farm and all, the, all these things are fascinating because it's, it's that next, next stage because a lot of our challenges right now, you take most farmers get some sort of free uh, satellite imagery data, whatever platform they're on, it doesn't matter. They'll send you something and most of that is useless because you're like, hey, this area that shows this field has some sort of crop mass problem. And you're like, well, I really don't know what that is because the field's fine, everything's fine, or they're trying to predict, predict yields, and I won't name the company right now, but my yields over the last three weeks have gone up 40 bushel, down 50 bushel, um, no rhyme or reason to anything, because I don't, I don't know what they're measuring it on, but we need those tools to be able to say how can we better effectively 
manage what we're doing. Um, but as I look at it also as, as the vice chair of the Nebraska Corn Board, and we're trying to figure out every year what, what is our budget going to be, and our budget is based off of production in Nebraska. Well, we're right now, we're kind of at, uh, in a lot of ways, we're, we're kind of back in the 1950s of drawing the drought monitor of, okay, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, because it's the best tool we currently have. The challenge becomes is that if you set that budget and then a drought comes in and now you've got a problem, which is still trying to predict yield, trying to predict what we're going to set our budget at, um, that affects a lot of things. That affects uh, what, we can, what we can do as an organization uh, spending money on, whether it's working with research on UNL or, or helping farmers find the next market development tool. And that, that's a big deal because that, that, that would be really helpful if we could say, okay, we actually have a handle on what yield's going to be. So we're not surprised. Um, and then from, from a national perspective, you know, we, we deal with a lot of farmers. We're representing farmers, roughly 40,000 dues paying members, and, and being able to most effectively help them as well to say, this is what we're looking out for. This is how we're, we're, we're utilizing um, your, your dollars into a national organization to protect the way of farming, and, and a lot of this comes down to how are, how are we going to mitigate these risks of, of um, adverse weather we, weather factors? You know, so whether it's uh, our neighbors and our, far, our farmer friends in Ohio that were planting in June for the first time because of the, in pure mud because it was raining too much, or the guys here in central Nebraska that held off a planting by a week, not because not because of rain. But it was too dry and too cold, and that that backed everything up and became a problem. So how is it we can start to to help the farmer in that perspective, not just on my own farm, but as a as a farm as a whole? Thanks, Brandon. All yours. Awesome. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, glad to see a lot of people in the audience uh, that I've been fortunate enough to spend time with. Um, so I'm Jackson Stansel. I'm the founder and CEO of Sentinel Fertigation. I'm also a PhD student uh, here at the University of Nebraska. Uh, Sentinel Fertigation, to give you a little bit of context, uh, we are an image-based fertigation scheduling company. Uh, so what we are uh, really trying to do is, uh, as Brandon mentioned, kind of take the next step beyond the free satellite imagery uh, that a lot of growers get through various different platforms uh, and actually take that satellite imagery and turn it into not only uh, insights and analytics but also a decision uh, recommendation that a farmer can take and essentially choose what to do with and hopefully help them inform their management practices. Um, we're also kind of taking, uh, taking steps toward making headway to identifying a specific problem uh, and not just generally having uh, kind of a biomass quantification uh, like Brandon mentioned, which is where a lot of our satellite products has been. It's, it's, it's been, you know, we can see problems in different areas of the field, uh, but, the, but the question is, until you can get out there and, and ground truth that, what really is that problem and how do we respond to it? Um, so the research and technology behind our, our company came out of my master's work here at UNL, and I won't get too far into that, and we can maybe get to it in the Q&A if anybody is, is interested. Um, but I, I want to kind of look at, I guess, what I'm seeing as far as trends uh, in, the, in the context in the agricultural industry. Um, so three things that, I, that I've really been seeing over the past few weeks, uh, and really past few months and, and years even, uh, is becoming big trends in the agricultural industry are, number one, regenerative agriculture. Uh, there are a lot of farmers here in Nebraska that are starting to uh, adopt regenerative practices. Uh, Nebraska's been no-till for a long time, and so that's, that's nothing new here, but there have been a lot of uh, cover crops uh, that farmers have been starting to use. Uh, farmers are starting to undertake uh, biological fertilizers, which is totally changing how folks are doing their nitrogen management. Um, and, and so these have been a lot of new practices that are coming in, and, and really uh, across the industry there's a lot of effort uh, going into how do we quantify the impacts of these regenerative practices uh, and, and kind of take us to a next step and another trend that we're seeing in agriculture right now, which is uh, alternative profit opportunities is what I would call them, but they're essentially ESG goals that, that corporate uh, buyers uh, of agricultural goods have, and they're, they're trying to uh, encourage sustainable practices on the farm. 
uh, as well as carbon markets and ecos other ecosystem services markets that are offering alternative profit opportunities uh, for farmers for quantified impacts uh, that they're, they're having through sustainable and regenerative practices. Um, another trend that I'm seeing out there is, is a willingness uh, for farmers to engage in more intensive management to overcome a lot of the risks that we're seeing from climate change. Uh, and also some of our production, <laughs> production uh, practices over the past 40, 50 years uh, with herbicides. Uh, farmers going back to uh, intensive cultivation to get rid of weeds. Farmers going to multiple split applications of fertilizer to both protect themselves against risk as well as increase the efficiency uh, in their crops. And so these are all big things uh, that, that farmers are trying to push towards, but they all come back to f being able to essentially quantify uh, crop production a little bit better and, and different things that are going on in the field. And so data is uh, an extremely important part uh, of agriculture at this point. Um, and, and specifically satellite data uh, is, is, as we've seen, I think in agriculture and across the industry uh, is by far the most scalable data source that we have um, and the one that is, is going to be the most readily available to make important decisions uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so in agriculture, what we really need for intensive man uh, management through monitoring uh, and decision making um, is we need essentially the right spectral response in our satellites to be able to quantify vegetation. Uh, we need really, really high throughput data, uh, both from a spatial resolution standpoint as well as a temporal resolution standpoint. Uh, for Sentinel, we are making uh, decisions every single time that an image comes into our system. Uh, and so we are ingesting satellite imagery on a, a near daily to daily basis uh, right now and making decisions uh, that quickly. And, and our farmers are actually looking at, at the platform every single day to see if there's something new uh, that's coming across that system. Farmers want this data and they want it in real time. Uh, so the way that, the, that we're accomplishing that right now is by working with a couple of commercial partners. Uh, we're working with Planet uh, that's supplying the near-daily satellite imagery uh, at 3 meter per pixel resolution, uh, including both the red edge and near-infrared bands, which are critical to us uh, for quantifying the normalized difference red edge index, uh, which is what we use to, to correlate back to nitrogen status and quantify uh, crop nitrogen status. We're also working with Airbus, uh, and we're early adopters of their new Pleiades Neo constellation, uh, which is producing 30 centimeter per pixel pan sharpened uh, multispectral imagery uh, that really allows us to, to do some excellent quantification of crop nitrogen status. Uh, and a lot of our, our farmers have responded really, really well uh, to having that imagery in the platform, not only from a nitrogen standpoint, but as well as the uh, ancillary benefits of being able to identify uh, sprinkler performance along pivots, uh, being able to identify areas of their crop that have been uh, blown down potentially by strong winds. Uh, and so there are a lot of other ancillary benefits uh, to this imagery. Um, and so I guess uh, I'd like to, <laughs> since that's mostly just a lot of context provided there, I just want to kind of finish up with one final thought uh, that I've been thinking about, especially with the Ukraine and Russia situation that we've all watched uh, play out and how it's affected agricultural markets, both from a commodity standpoint, uh, as well as from uh, an input supply standpoint. Uh, agriculture and national security are not, <laughs> not uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, these are critically linked topics. Um, and, and I think that's a perfect reason why NASA, as kind of a, you know, a U.S. agency, uh, should be playing in the agriculture space. Um, and I think it's, it's critical to national security that we continue to improve our data sets and the way in which we can quantify what's going on uh, on the farm. Um, and, and I would also go kind of back to the Huerman lecture mission, right, which is sustainability and security, I believe is what I heard earlier. earlier. I think sustainability really is security, and we've got to preserve our natural resources uh, in order to, to preserve really our most valuable asset as a country. Um, and I think a lot of countries feel the same way. And so if agriculture has an outsized impact on our natural resources, um, this is a, it's a really important thing to get right for preserving those natural resources long-term. So with that, that's kind of all that I, I have to say, and I'll turn it back over to Mark. <clears throat> Thanks, Jackson. And please join me in thanking the panelists for their comments too. Okay, uh, before I call up Brad and Forrest, um, well, why don't you guys come on up? Brad um, and Forrest, both on NASA. We've got California represented, and we have uh, headquarters in D.C. represented. Forrest is from California, and Brad's coming in from D.C. I'd like to offer you the opportunity, Karen, to any quick response to anything you heard from our partners on the ground. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, what you both said is, is part of, uh, we, we, we spent, the day traveling uh, around uh, the area and, and talking with um, with farmers and and uh, and experts and we heard a lot of those same 
themes, right? So it's taking what, uh, what we can see from space, scaling it, making sure it's accurate, and making sure it's uh, usable to inform decisions. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, it's, I think your, your comments were really in, insightful, and I absolutely agree with you. Part of, I didn't really focus on it in, in my talk, but, um, but yeah, that one of the great things about uh, satellites and that unique vantage point of space is that we can see the entire globe. And that means we have insight into what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and so forth. And, uh, and, and we can, understand, again, not what's just what's happening here, but what's happening in other countries and how that may have an impact uh, on what's happening here. So, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, okay, at this point, we're going to open it up for questions, and Jesse's going to run around with the mic. And, and please uh, identify your name, if you could, for the people online as well. Thanks. My name is Don Nelson. I'm from Lincoln. Could one of you explain or contrast the difference in the platforms and the programs that you're dealing with at NASA and those up in South Dakota with the Eros program? Okay. I, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I, I'm Brad Dorn. I'm the program manager uh, in Karen's program for the agriculture and water application research area. So um, thanks for bringing up Eros. Eros uh, is a, a key uh, partner of ours. Uh, we actually work with them. They are a USGS facility. And so you've all heard about the Landsat satellite on NASA develops, launches uh, that satellite, and then when it's operational, it turns it over to USGS. USGS then operates that satellite, uh, but NASA does have a backup operational system in Goddard, but we operate that satellite, um, that USGS does, out of Aeros Data Center, and they store all that Landsat data. And they're also a DAC, which is an archive uh, partner of NASA. So it is a USGS facility, but we have a very tight and close relationship with them. Uh, do you want to clarify that? Anything I said on that? So, so the only thing, thanks so much, Brad. The only thing I would, um, would augment that with is, yeah, so I, I count Landsat as, as uh, two, again, two of the 25 missions that I mentioned. It is a partnership mission. It's an operational mission. So it's very similar in some ways to the weather satellites. Uh, NASA builds the weather satellites for NOAA. It's a little bit of a different model, but, uh, but that too is a partnership. And then uh, within the NASA Earth Science Program, we're looking to build, we're looking to demonstrate and develop the next generation so that Landsat Next is more capable than Landsat was. But we'll, we'll do that demonstration with the missions that we build out of the Earth Science Program to inform the next generation of operational missions. Just one thing to add. One thing that the USGS and NASA programs all have in common is the data, data is freely and publicly available to all users. And one of the things I'm excited about is companies like Jackson starting to use and consume those products and develop applications for farmers, for producers in the field that help them manage resources in way that, ways that reduce input costs and improve their overall profit, profitability and sustainability. Oh, thank you. And I'm Forrest Melton. I'm a research scientist out of NASA Ames Research Center and the program scientist for the NASA Western Water Applications Office. Hi, uh, Matt Hammonds from Lincoln. I wondered if you could comment on a couple of things. The First Street Foundation's recent report about the extreme heat zone that goes up in the middle of the US, um, just commenting on, on that prediction of, of does that align with other things that you've seen? And then also talk a bit about the role of an organization like First Street Foundation, which I had never, never heard of before as it relates to academia, government, producers, and industry. 
Okay, I'm in the hot seat now. Um, <laughs> I, actually, uh, Ed Kearns, who is, uh, uh, well, I don't know if he is the principal for, uh, for First Street, but Ed, Ed is an old friend of mine from my NOAA days. Um, and, you know, I think uh, when, I, when I took this job uh, with NASA, one of the reasons I took the job was because, or, or one of the, well, let's face it, one of the reasons I lobbied to get the job is because I knew there was going to be so much demand for actionable information. So First Street is trying to fill that niche. I don't have insight into uh, their calibration and validation of their, of their products, so I can't, I can't comment on the accuracy, but I think it is further evidence that there's there's demand for information on multiple time scales, frankly, right? The, the immediate two-week time scales, the seasonal, and then the, the longer term, right? Because decisions have to, um, have to be made on different time scales, right? Depending on the level of investment and development. So I think First Street uh, is one of, of, I think, several um, private sector entities we'll see popping up that are trying to fill that uh, that need, but I can't. Unfortunately, I can't comment on the accuracy. Hi, my name is Amit. What I wanted to understand that you talked about uh, nitrogen management, especially having the red S by using the satellite imagery going in the NIR band. But from the nitrogen perspective, especially when the cons are mature on 70 days, nitrogen stress are coming from the bottom leaf side. How you are able to identify that from the top at that particular time? Oh, I guess I have a mic, don't I? We've been passing the mic back and forth. <laughs> I'm like, let's get a mic. No. Uh, so, Essentially, what, what we're looking at is we have infield calibration plots. That's part of our, our fundamental uh, part of our fundamental framework. Uh, we locate those strategically. It's kind of a zone sampling based approach. Um, and what we've seen is that we're able to see differentiation in, in photosynthetic rate, which is essentially what you're quantifying, right, when you're using a vegetation index um, between these different nitrogen rates uh, and, and essentially a very small differentiation range. Um, and so what you're really seeing, even, even though nitrogen stress is coming, yes, from the bottom of the plant, there's an impact on photosynthetic rate that the plant will start to expose, um, you know, due to any sort of nitrogen stress there. And so with having these, these offset rates, we can be predictive without having to fully see the bottom of the canopy. Higher resolution imagery helps us get deeper into the canopy. Obviously, 30 centimeters still isn't going to get it done. I mean, you need to get down to probably one and a half, two centimeters to really be able to see that. Uh, the issue is scalability with, with drones, right? And so that's, that's how we're, we're trying to manage around it, do it at scale, uh, and still quantify well. I have several qu questions that came in online that I'll ask. This one's through Twitter. I think we have quite a few students who are in the audience today. So the question is, how have careers in these fields changed? And how do young people prepare for these changing career opportunities? I can give you my thoughts so we can pass around the, the, form, the table here. Um, we've seen a big shift uh, into geospatial, uh, no doubt about it. Big data, analysis of the data. We have so much data, the problem isn't always just the data, it's the analysis of the data. Uh, the, inter the distilling of it, right? And, and then making it usable, right? We heard you talk about that. It's, it's one thing to develop something, it's another to make sure that people will use it. So stakeholder engagement, the social science blending in with that, I think is critical as well. But for me, you know, we're at our shop, we've just hired a couple geospatial folks. It's easier to, it seems like, to, to hire those folks right now than it was to get a climatologist. And I think climatology is a big thing right now. So. Um, it's out there, there's a huge market for that and the GIS geospatial realm. So, classes, right? I mean, the, the, the curriculum is where that comes back to and then not only just the curriculum, but can it be broader than just GIS geospatial analysis as a tool, but as an application and have that context, that more holistic understanding of how that system works, 
like we talked about the hydrologic cycle in one of my slides, how do they, how do they piece that all together and use the big data and then be able to analyze it geospatially at, at various scales? Anyone else want to tackle it? Um, so I would just say that uh, at NASA, you know, so I, I focused a lot on the satellites. We also have a pretty big research and analysis program that, uh, that funds basic research based on the measurements we make. And that's generally organized around the traditional scientific disciplines, you know, uh, atmospheric chemistry, weather, uh, weather phenomena, uh, and that sort of thing. But what I'm seeing is an ever increasing interest in the applied sciences. So we're seeing a lot more students come along who may enter the, the process through a traditional discipline, but by the time they get to uh, generally, you know, even early in their graduate ed education, or maybe even late in their undergraduate, they're really looking toward how do I how do I put this knowledge to work? How do I turn it into a product? How do I uh, turn it into a service? They're really pushing toward applications, which are in many cases multidisciplinary. They cut across those traditional uh, academic disciplines. And so related to that, we're seeing a lot more uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teaming uh, to, to get to those, those applications. People are looking to have an impact. Students are looking to have an impact. You guys probably. One, one thing before you jump in, one thing I forgot to mention is pretty important. Assuming that student was here at Nebraska, I mean, the Remote Sensing Center is right here in the School of Natural Resources on East Campus. So these classes are available through, through them on the GIS and Remote Sensing side. So I would say uh, Google Dr. Wardla. <laughs> You know, I, I think from the, the perspective of, um, oh my God, there it is. All right. Um, I, I, ha I have a bunch of kids, um, <laughs> like I think seven. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's not space, you know, for all to come back to the farm right now. And my brother has four. So we've got 11 kids, a lot of kids between the two of us. But beginning to understand that, you know, some of this, this introduction to some of the next stage is, it has to go all the way back to elementary school and getting them working with the, the small schools, you know, whether it's in the state of Nebraska or wherever else, but saying, hey, let's introduce these kids to, to robotics, to, to uh, programming, to data analytics at a very early age because there's some of them, like my son, who's, who really likes to do that stuff and may never want to set foot uh, in a, in a cornfield but wants to be involved in agriculture. And I, I, to me, that's, that's very cool. I, I, don't, I don't care where he's, how, he, how he accomplishes it, but if that's what he wants to do, and I think it's, it's a greater emphasis on that at an, at an early stage, and those of us within these farming communities saying, hey, we've, we're willing to work with our local schools, our local 4-Hs, whatever the case might be, to bring that in and to make sure that they're able to um, fully realize their potential so we don't you know, you, you talk about it, and I'll talk about briefly from the brain drain aspect of, is that we want those bright young kids to come back to rural America and be able to develop the next big product like Jackson is and be able to do that in a way that, that have hands-on experience but, but without losing them. And we know there are ones out there that are very interested in it. Good afternoon, Jay Rempe from here in Lincoln, and thank you for all of you for appearing this afternoon. Very, very interesting. Uh, just kind of a two-part question. One, I was, I was at a conference, similar topic, uh, a couple years ago, and one of the presenters talked about how managing on the farm has changed over time. We used to manage at the field level, then we moved to the area level. Now we're getting closer to the acre level, and he postulated that he thought that in the near future we'd be managing at the plant level, each individual plant level. And I'm curious with the data and the sensing technologies that NASA and others provide, do you see that in the future from, from your vantage point? And then this is more for, for Brandon and Jackson. If we're getting to that point, how is the farmer going, what is the farmer going to look like in the future compared to today uh, as you look at a future like that? I guess I'll, I'll leave this one off a little bit. So um, in, in terms of managing at the plant level, I think we still have a long way to go to get there. 
because um, I, I think there's a difference between managing and being able to analyze at the plant level. Because we're able to analyze at the plant level right now. With managing, we have to have machinery systems that match up our and match up with our data, and those machinery systems have to be available on the farm. And to me, the machinery systems being available on the farm is what we aren't quite uh, there with yet. Um, and I would say that's specifically true for irrigated agriculture, where we're using pivots, drip irrigation systems, uh, those sorts of tools to manage water. Uh, none of those tools are really to the point where we can manage to a plant level. Uh, you know, reality is that even if you've got the top of the line VRI system, you're still going to be managing about a 36 by 36 foot square that's covering a lot of plants. Um, now, can we analyze at the plant level right now? Absolutely. I mean, there are commercial systems out there that can, you know, tell you every single, uh, you know, sprout that's coming up out of the ground when you're getting a stand, a stand count. I mean, we're, we're to that point, and we can quantify, you know, reflectance off of each plant if we really want to. Um, but the question is, can we isolate what stressors those are and, and all that sort of stuff? So, uh, in my mind, we still have a long way to go, mostly from the machinery angle, to get to the point where we're, we're managing. I think robotics are going to be really what's necessary to get to that point. Um, so, that's where we have to go, but in terms of what the farmer is going to look like, and I'm sure Brandon has a much better answer to, to what that would look like because uh, I've not been a farmer, but I think ultimately they're going to be uh, a, a data manager and a, and a systems manager, uh, and, and I think farm offices are going to look a whole lot more like, uh, like spaceship command centers, uh, really truthfully, than, than workshops in a lot of ways. Um, and I think we've already seen that in the combine. I mean, there are more screens in a combine than there are in my office. Um, you know, and, and I think that's, uh, that, that speaks a lot about what farmers have to deal with from a data uh, and, and computer uh, aspect right now. Yeah, I think from the uh, managing from a, a singular plant level, I think we, we run into some challenges at first, going back to robotics, is, is until, until we're fully capable to A, accept that and be there available, I don't know how we get to that point because there's a lot of, just drive around the state of Nebraska and you'll see how many big tractors there are and we're not willing to give those up yet um, you know there, there's there's some sort of status symbol about having the biggest tractor in the neighborhood um, and, and guys like to drive them but I, I'm the opposite of that I would rather let a robot do it if I, we get to that point that I would love to just set it loose and let it do it do its thing but the, the farm farmer of the future um, and I'll go back to there was a book that I had when I was a kid um, and for the life of me, I can't find this book, and it, and it really bothers me because there was one picture in this book, and it was kind of like everything in the future. You know, some of it was protein and, uh, and whatever else was going to happen. One of them was the farm of the future. And it was, you know, basically you had a control tower, and, and this farm was controlling, the, the farmer was sitting up there, and could ro the robots were, were still large equipment, but it was your combine, it was your apple pickers, uh, which was interesting because some of those apple pickers we've already seen come to to fruition but being able to run that from from in this case a control tower but i think it'll be running it from the phone obviously in in, in our case but i think it's going to have to be a lot more hands-on of understanding you know the data that goes around the farm how to how to implement the the important practices to to maintain yield and and you know whatever whatever carbon market or whatever the next stage is of that you're involved with and really really having to dig deeper into into the science aspect of it than we have in the past because um, a lot of us can manage the the basics out there I mean I'm pretty sure I could probably turn my nine-year-old loose and said I, I need this this and this done to raise a corn crop figure it out and she could probably do it um, but to get to that next level to truly understand what that what that means to to really manage that plant it's gonna it's gonna be a big change and you know we've got college students in here I mean this is gonna be right in their wheelhouse of learning all of this you know those of us that have been around for a while you know it's probably gonna pass us by I just want to make one quick comment to give this to Forrest too because uh, of his experience out in the field but I think this is personifies why we're here NASA's here in that you know, we're, we need to figure out what's NASA, what's space role in those new mechanized systems. We're not going to do it. You know, the farmer's going to do it. The ag industry is going to do it. What's NASA's role? How do we support that? What type of data? 
Uh, and sometimes, you know, what type of, you know, what does uh, your nation's space agency need to do in this space to make sure we're confident and comfortable and have trust in this information? I'll just name one thing we're doing now. It's a small, uh, one, it's a pretty big thing. It's just small as we lead into this new era. And that is one, Karen runs lots of programs. She didn't have time to talk about. One of them is we're buying a lot of commercial satellite data, including planet data, and evaluating it. Is it really doing uh, what we think we can do? Maybe it can do more. Uh, that's why they're teaming with us. So part of our job is to evaluate all these systems, not just what NASA launches up there, but on these other systems. So this is why we uh, are so interested in having these conversations, because that's going to help us understand what's NASA's role need to be, how do we need to integrate our data. We had a lot of talk just this morning on how to integrate our data into decision-making systems on the farm. So uh, it's, it's a great topic, and I, I look forward to the next few years of really talking and getting more detail on this. But I'm sure Forrest has a few comments. I'll just say that a big <clears throat> part of this trip for us is listening and learning. And I think one of the things we heard clearly on our visit this morning was that folks were looking for information products that help them make a decision, not information products that tell them what to do. And I think whatever the farm of the future looks like, there will always be a role for the knowledge and experience of the individual farmer and producer. And so there will be a limit to the spatial scale at which we can manage, because there has to be a scale at which a person can take the information, combine it with their knowledge and experience and sense of the land, and make a decision. And it's hard for me to envision we'll ever get to the plant scale, but with nine kids, maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> we might get there. I could be wrong. Jesse, any more online questions? I do have a couple more online questions that surrounded data security. And I think there's a lot of concern, especially from producers, about data security. Um, can you talk a little bit about what NASA and or the university is doing in that area? Yeah, we, we, we definitely realize if our data is going to be useful, all of a sudden, it's, we're going to have data security issues, uh, and, and it's, there's going to be sensitivities. And we do definitely understand that. We understand there's, uh, there has been uh, groups, organizations, and also commercial entities that have solved these problems, made it more confident. This is a new space for us, uh, um, but it, it's also one that kind of tells us we're getting relevant <laughs> when people are concerned about that. But uh, we're dedicated to making sure, one, our data is freely open and available to all, all farmers, all producers. Yeah, uh, that's our, our role in the, in the federal government. But also recognizing that need to make sure our data is secure. Uh, we're, we are working this issue with a number of organizations. We certainly work hand in hand. And I know USDA has a number of protocols and how they handle it. Um, but it is a new area and one we're taking very, very seriously. Uh, Forrest, do you want to comment or talk? Okay. I would take the university. Oh, yeah. Okay. You, I, I just have one, while you're getting the mic, Mike, I'll just mention one thing, Greg, is, yeah, everything we're working with right now, a lot of that stuff I showed you is public domain because it is NASA, right? So I don't have to worry about that part of it. but. For example, we have a big new project with Department of Defense. There you get into all sorts of issues with classified or even unclassified data, export control of that data. It's under wraps. It's tight. <laughs> so I can tell you uh, for, for sure the university, uh, we just went through that process of making sure we could, through that um, standard operating procedures, whatever you want to call it, that the university is developing. So I'll segue to you, Greg. So uh, we are very aware that many producers are are concerned about the information that they generate on their farm, the data that goes into their combine or comes out of their planter, and what the value of that is. And there's a growing uncomfortability out there, I think, of how that is used by bigger companies that maybe uh, are making marketing decisions based on what their herbicide use, what their fertilizer use is, and whether or not that information is being used against them. The university applied for and received a grant 
that we are working across the United States and uh, divided up the United States into regions to look at how a land grant university might be able to uh, work with farmers and ranchers to make sure that uh, uh, we could help them manage their data, get value out of their data if there's value there, and also maybe work with groups and organizations that can help them interpret their data in the future. Uh, we also have uh, a, uh, com the Holland Computing Center that is, uh, I think, moving to Innovation Campus, if I remember correctly, but they're, uh, uh, is that right? Working on working on uh, increasing their capacity and moving in there, but that is a strength that we have as a university that could be leveraged into this data to help agriculture as well. You know, one one other example I can give you too. Um, you know, at the beginning of the season, we kind of know acreage intent of planning and what they're going to plant, but we don't know where and how many acres exactly. So the models and everything, we have to, there's a lag there to wait till we have enough canopy for the sensors to tell us what that crop is. So there's things like that that are, are going to build in sort of a lag in detection or early warning, if you will, uh, based on that, because we don't know the specifics of that at that time. So is, are, are there ways in the future to uh, use that data, but yet not release it or uh, develop derived products off of that data? that keep the, the proprietary nature of it or the, or the privacy nature of it uh, secure. Hi, my name's Mike Shugru, an agronomist from here in Lincoln. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to uh, have this Q&A session and, and have the information sharing that's going on. Um, a question concerning carbon. You know, that's, that's the hot topic in ag right now. Do you currently have the ability to measure soil carbon like you do soil moisture in, in, from a satellite perspective versus soil testing? short answer is, is no. Uh, uh, we're, we certainly have data that's valuable to put in the models that can help assess soil carbon. Um, but that is a challenge uh, and we certainly are going to be working on it. But uh, at this point, no, we, uh, we, uh, we don't have that ability. But I do think we, uh, we certainly have a lot of data that's going to be valuable to deriving those capabilities and that uh, those soil carbon uh, outputs. Yeah, worth men mentioning, I think that a lot of the facilities here uh, and um, that are run by the University of Nebraska are really important to helping develop the science and figuring out how we combine satellite data with in situ data to provide a, uh, an ability to calculate soil carbon at an acceptable level of accuracy. So um, we were lucky enough to go out and see some of the sites that we've used, that I've used in the past to uh, assess the accuracy of different satellite data products. Uh, and I cannot, um, I cannot overemphasize how valuable those capabilities are for advancing our ability to measure soil carbon, uh, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and other uh, variables that are really important to agricultural production. Brad wants to quick follow up, Greg, sorry. Yeah, th this morning we had such a great conversation about this topic and, and one of the issues what we're, they're realizing is at some point we're going to have to scale whatever those sensors are saying to a larger area and we understand that capability is going to be satellite imagery. So that interaction, just like Forrest said, the discussion with uh, UNL and other labs around the country of understanding then how do we do that with satellite imagery, combined obviously with uh, the ground sensors, will be, uh, I think that, it, that will be how we move forward with uh, assessing soil health and doing it in a way that's consistent across the country for the markets, for you know, whatever we put out there. So Jesse said the, uh, that that was the last question, so we'll, uh, I'll take my cue and, uh, and want to thank the panelists for their time here. Uh, this morning, it was pretty gratifying as uh, uh, 
I guess a university employee, to have people from NASA out that wanted to take pictures with the stuff that we had out in the field and, and be able to take that home and show, hey, I really was out here where they're doing this. And, and so uh, maybe I'm over, over exaggerating, but it, uh, I thought it was pretty cool that people like this want to take a picture uh, on our research farms with our, our equipment. Uh, I also think that it was very important that uh, Karen and her team take time to come out here. Uh, when I was with USDA, you can sit in, in Washington, D.C. or wherever your office is, if you're in a regional one, and you can get lots of information, but until you actually go out in the field and kick some dust up and talk to farmers and understand what their problems are, it's, it, you don't get a real picture of how you uh, help them get to a solution. And so I think we re should really show appreciation for them uh, extending uh, the offer to come out here today and, uh, and uh, thank Mike for taking them up on that offer and uh, converting it into a Hurman lecture. Uh, this is very indicative of the value of these lectures in sharing information uh, from academia, farmers, uh, developers of new products that are, are out there and uh, it's just a great opportunity. One of the um, cool things, uh, another cool thing about the Hurman Lectures is that when they started, there was a medallion designed that is unique and, on, and all ours, that uh, participants in the panels and speakers at the Hurman Lecture each get one of these medallions to take home with them. And uh, I truly believe they're a keepsake. I don't have one, probably never will. So you should all, all be very happy you're getting one today. Or, but, so thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So you already gave everybody a hand for being here today, but uh, I think this was a great lecture. Thank you for attending. Thank you for those of you that are online attending and submitting questions. I'm sure we could have gone on longer for questions, uh, but you know, all good things have to come to an end, I believe. And so thank you uh, again, and uh, have a safe trip home.